from the forbidden city in Beijing to the shadow of Mount Rushmore. I fought for you. I fought for your family. I fought for our country. Above all, I fought for America and all it stands for. President Trump was saying, we're putting America's interests first. And he understood from the very beginning that the whole thing was China. China has created, in my opinion, it's the single greatest theft in the history of the world. They have taken money and jobs and factories. And he was saying to China, you're not going to take advantage of us anymore. One of the most divisive presidents in history, riding roughshod over conventions at home and abroad. Trump put Angela Merkel right on the spot. He started careening from topic to topic like a squirrel caught in traffic. I mean, he flipped furious. In this final episode, Donald Trump drives America towards a nuclear showdown. We understood that if you go in small, you've got to be prepared to go in all the way. I left Pyongyang terrified that what we really risked was an accidental war. He takes on China in a battle for global supremacy and tries to strike the deal of the century. This is the affinity that Trump has with authoritarian leaders. Xi Jinping doesn't have term limits, and I think Trump envied that. Settle down, guys. You all right? Tell me when you're ready. Ready? OK. Well, I just had uh, the opportunity to have an excellent conversation with President-elect Trump. Two days after being elected, Donald Trump met President Obama for the customary handover. We discussed a lot of different situations, some wonderful and some difficulties. We want to do everything we can to help you succeed, because if you succeed, then the country succeeds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Away from the cameras, Obama delivered a sobering message. China wasn't the only problem in Asia. President Obama said to Trump, he said, you know, the biggest foreign policy crisis you're going to face, and you could face it right away, is with North Korea. And so I took it really seriously, because the Obama administration, their policy towards North Korea was strategic patience, which basically meant kick the can down the road. I was concerned that, yes, that would be our first crisis. And I was concerned that it could happen as early as the first week of the Trump administration. The new president put North Korea right at the top of his agenda. Trump said, how is it possible that previous presidents have not addressed this problem? From Eisenhower on down, how is it possible that they allowed a country which still thinks it's at war with us, which has developed nuclear weapons and ballistic missile capability to deliver those weapons to US cities and incinerate US cities? And he said, I will not pass this problem on to another president. North Korea's leader, the 32-year-old Kim Jong-un, had vowed to follow in the footsteps of his father and grandfather by pursuing a nuclear weapon that could destroy the imperialist power of America. Trump told his deputy national security advisor to start knocking heads together. I went around the room and I said, we've been doing the same carrots and the same sticks. We threaten North Korea with economic ruin, and then they come to the negotiating table and we give up the sanctions and we reward them with carrots. There's always been divisions and kind of uh, difficulty in getting consensus within the US government on how to approach North Korea. So this policy process that KT started was really important. I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think outside the box, way outside the box. On one hand, I want you to just think through what would happen if the United States recognized North Korea as a nuclear weapons state. On the other hand, 
What would happen if the United States took military action against North Korea or regime change? It was really the first and last normal policy process on any foreign policy issue in this administration that I saw. Just six weeks after Trump was sworn in, North Korea put on a show of strength when it launched four ballistic missiles into the Sea of Japan. McFarlane took the findings of her report to her boss. What the work revealed on North Korea was that, hey, we just couldn't afford to, to repeat the failed pattern of previous efforts to get North Korea to denuclearize. So we pulled together, I would say it was like taking threads, economic, political, military, cyber, covert, overt. And it was instead of saying, we're gonna do a carrot and a stick on off switch, it was gonna be a dial where we would constantly up the ante, make things a little tougher across all of those platforms until the, until the North Koreans came to the negotiating table. We brought to the president options for a strategy that became known as maximum pressure. And this was really based on the premise that the United States and its allies and partners uh, could convince uh, Kim Jong-un, the Kim family regime, you know, that, that they're safer without nuclear weapons than they are with nuclear weapons. But there was a problem. The vast majority of North Korean trade crossed its border with China. Trump would need Chinese support to really dial up the pressure on Kim. But the president had done little to win friends in Beijing. We can't continue to allow China to rape our country, and that's what they're doing. It's the greatest theft in the history of the world. They're building a massive military fortress in the middle of the South China Sea that they're not allowed to do. They take our money. They take our jobs. And we owe them $1.6 trillion. It's like, how does that happen? Trump hoped to make a breakthrough on North Korea when he invited the Chinese president to his Florida resort of Mar-a-Lago. President Xi said uh, there's a thousand reasons to have a good relationship with the US, and not a single reason to have a bad relationship. That's why President Xi took all the trouble, <laughs> fly all the Pacific Ocean, uh, travel to Florida, to uh, Malago to meet President Trump. It was clear to me that the president was investing and invested in his relationship with Xi. I think it was more important that he have the ability to call Xi and talk to him on the phone afterwards than to try and get a specific agreement done in mar lago Trump turned to his family to break the ice. We wanted to make you feel at home. I remember very well President Trump's granddaughter singing <laughs> Chinese songs was really amazing, a surprise, and uh, that was really something very impressive. The staff was on the other side of the doors, so we could peer in and see what was going on, and we could see it was a good, warm moment. Once the pleasantries were over, the two sides got to work on the thorny issues of trade and North Korea. What we decided is to convince the Chinese leadership that the threat from North Korea is not just an you know, a, a intercontinental ballistic missile aimed at Seattle, Washington. It's, it's also the threat that the non-proliferation regime breaks down in Northeast Asia and across Asia. How long before Japan has a discussion about getting a nuclear weapon or South Korea, you know, or Taiwan or Vietnam? That's not China's interest. In the US, there was a widely accepted misperception that North Korea is China's problem. And if China wants, China can stop the North Korea nuclear program. But from China's perspective, of course, that's not uh, correct. North Korea want to develop their nuclear technology because they feel uh, insecure. And uh, who caused that sense of uh, insecurity? I think that's the US. We've had a long discussion already 
And so far, I have gotten nothing, absolutely nothing. <laughs> but we have developed a friendship. I can see that. And I think long term, we're going to have a very, very great relationship. And I look very much forward to it. Behind the scenes, they were beginning to make some progress. We were willing to press North Korea to some extent, try to impose some sanctions, and try to force them to, to talk, to negotiate with the United States. China can help, can try to facilitate the dialogue, but China cannot solve the issue um, for the United States. I said, look, you have a tremendous power because of trading through the border. And I can tell you, China will do much better on trade if they help us with North Korea. Xi's willingness to help would soon be put to the test. Three months later, North Korea launched its first intercontinental ballistic missile over the Pacific. The UN Security Council voted on a resolution to implement massive sanctions on North Korea's key industries. China backed the move. But rather than bring the North Koreans to the negotiating table, the sanctions ratcheted up the tensions even further. <laughs> North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury, the likes of which this world has never seen before. The president making the ominous comments from his golf club in Bedminster. <laughs> Those of us who've worked on North Korea are more acutely aware of how little we know about how they might react to some things, and we were worried that this was really going to be a setback for our diplomacy. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson was on a trip to Asia when his president threatened nuclear war. When Rex Tillerson heard the fire and fury comments, he was very unhappy. It was pretty hard to be Secretary of State for President Trump um, because it's very hard to have uh, a profile of your own separate from the president, and he was grappling with that on the trip. Strategy. What the president is doing is sending a strong message to North Korea in language that Kim Jong-un would understand. Within weeks, North Korea's military carried out another test, claiming they had miniaturized a nuclear weapon. <laughs> Kim could now boast that he was ready to strike America. As Trump arrived at the UN General Assembly, nuclear war had rarely felt so close. The United States has great strength and patience, but if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Rocket man, is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. North Korea's foreign minister was watching. Afterwards, he went to see the UN Secretary General and his top conflict prevention official, Jeff Feltman. Also attending 
was North Korea's ambassador to the UN. Ambassador Ja crossed over to my side of the table and basically grabbed me by the arm and pulled me out of the room. And once we were outside, Ambassador Ja said to the foreign minister, this is Jeff Feltman, and the foreign minister turned to me and said, we would like to invite you to Pyongyang for policy dialogue. What do we do with this invitation? There had been no UN political talks in Pyongyang with the North Koreans since February 2010. The mood in the Security Council was pressure, pressure, pressure. To take up the invitation, Feltman would need to get sign-off from the key players at the UN. He knew the Americans would be the hardest to persuade. Jeff Feltman came to see me and I said, you know, Jeff, uh, we really don't want the UN to be getting involved in distracting the North Koreans at this point. We've built up this maximum pressure campaign. We want them to be focused on us. Susan said, look, things are so serious right now. The last thing we need is some sort of theatrics from you, Jeff Feltman, going to Pyongyang um, and being instrumentalized by the North Koreans. Make it, have the North Koreans look like everything's fine. The UN has shown up, everything's fine. We've seen this before with the North Koreans where they get multiple things going and they play parties off one another. So I went back to New York, and the Secretary General said, well, let's just not answer the North Koreans right now. Let's just wait. Let's not say anything. On a visit to Beijing, Tillerson let slip. He was exploring his own talks with the North Koreans, only to be slapped down. Trump appeared to undermine a new diplomatic channel announced just yesterday by the Secretary of State. I told Rex Tillerson he's wasting his time trying to negotiate with little Rocket Man. Save your energy, Rex. We'll do what has to be done. The president's going to, the president's going to communicate the way he communicates. My job as chief diplomat is to ensure that the North Koreans know we keep our channels open. I'm listening. Our diplomatic efforts will continue until that first bomb drops. My job is to never have a reason for the first bomb to drop. The policy at the time was you know, to, to forego attempts to initiate a dialogue until there was real pressure. But you know, if you're the State Department, hey, you do diplomacy. I mean, you, I mean, you can't help yourself, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's what you do. A few weeks later, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres visited the White House. They were comparing notes on what was happening, what might be possible, how dangerous was it, you know, how likely would military, would a military um, response be, all that sort of thing. And Secretary General Guterres said to President Trump, Jeff Feltman has this, you know, strange invitation to go to Pyongyang and lead a policy dialogue with North Koreans. And Trump leaned, leaned over toward him and said, Jeff Feltman should go to Pyongyang. And Jeff Feltman should tell the North Koreans, I'm willing to sit down with Kim Jong-un. It was an extraordinary U-turn for a president who had just told his secretary of state that diplomacy was a waste of time. The plan would be kept under wraps. In public, the mantra remained, maximum pressure. The US Navy started moving warships towards the Korean peninsula. We weren't going through this as an exercise just for the entertainment of it. We understood it at the Department of Defense. If you go in small, you've got to be prepared to go in all the way. Certainly, all the estimates were that, that a war with North Korea would be extremely costly, not only for the United States, but, but more to the point, South Korea. En route to his first summit in Beijing, Trump stopped off in South Korea. 30,000 US troops stationed there had been conducting joint exercises with their South Korean allies for decades. They were now on high alert. I just want to thank General Brooks and everybody that is working with us so hard on the situation in North Korea. The Chinese government was playing a crucial role in putting the pressure on North Korea. 
But the hardliners on Trump's team argued it was now time to get tough with President Xi on trade. There was really a tug of war between two groups. One was the, what I call the, the panda huggers. A lot of them were from Wall Street. They had grown rich on trade with China. And they envisioned the relationship with China to be very much the same. It would be, don't rock the boat. Keep US-China trade right where it is. And then there were the China hawks. Um, the China hawks said, if we continue with the relationship as it has been, the United States will, over time, no longer be the most powerful economic, political, diplomatic um, country in the world, that we will cede that place to China. The Chinese rolled out what they called a State Visit Plus. And Trump became the first foreign leader ever to be given the honor of a dinner inside the Forbidden City. It was interesting the way that President Xi was using history to send a message that China has taken center stage. And here is a US president coming to visit Beijing. China is over, you know, what its, its leaders refer to as the century of humiliation and is now taking its rightful place in the world. You all having fun? Yes, sir. That's something. I'm, we're having a great time. Thank you. Mr. President, thank you very much. It's an honor to be with you. The hosting of the military parade this morning was magnificent, and the world was watching. When the agenda moved to trade, the president gave the floor to one of his top China hawks. I said, listen, you have to see the way this looks to us. I thought, uh, as the president did, that we had a very unbalanced, unfair relationship. The nature of their system is one of state-controlled capitalism, and they were using the power of the state to help win the competition. What we have to do is figure out a way to deal with it so that we're not the people paying the tab and so that we're treated fairly. The United States really has to change its policies because they've gotten so far behind on trade with China. For now, the president could only push things so far. He still needed China's help. Our meeting this morning was excellent, discussing North Korea. As Trump flew back to America, Jeff Feltman was making his final preparations for the most important diplomatic mission of his life. The dates were set by the, the North Koreans for early, for early December. And then on November 29th, the North Koreans launched an ICBM that they said was capable of reaching any part of the United States and declared that they had achieved the historic moment of completing their nuclear and rocket program. A missile was launched a little while ago from North Korea, I will only tell you that we will take care of it. It is a situation that we will handle. I checked with the permanent missions again. Do we, do we proceed with the trip or not, given what just happened? And in this case, all of the missions said, at this point, go. Is it possible to say a few words about your visit? I, I need to brief the Secretary General first. Thank you. The major message I tried to get across, and this is a response to their arguments about the need for deterrence, is that what they see as deterrence can provoke the very war that they believe they're deterring. And they said, we know that the U.S. has absolute military power. We know that the U.S. could destroy us. We know that our air defenses couldn't protect us from a sustained U.S. strike. 
So essentially, when we know the U.S. is about to strike because the U.S. is going to go to war against us, we're going to have to go first because that's our chance. And, and, and I said, what if you're wrong? You know, I said to the North Koreans, they wouldn't know if they were accidentally stepping over a red line that would force some kind of military reaction from the United States. You know, I'm an American. I do not know what Trump's red lines are. You certainly do not know what Trump's red lines are. Their response invariably was, our leader doesn't make a mistake. Our leader will know when the U.S. is about to go to war. The, 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 our leader will know. Feltman was yet to deliver his message from Trump. He asked to speak to the foreign minister in private. Good morning. Thank you very much for this honor. I'm said President Trump himself had asked to have me convey a message. And that message was that he would be willing, under the right conditions, to sit down with Kim Jong-un. There was a bit of silence before the foreign minister said, you know, I don't believe you. Why should I believe you? And I said, look, I'm not asking you to believe me. What I'm telling you is that the UN was entrusted with a message from President Trump I am the carrier of that message. Thank you. I went to Pyongyang deeply, deeply concerned, given this feeling that war was imminent. I left Pyongyang terrified that what we really risked was an accidental war. Kim's New Year's address offered little reassurance. 사랑하는 온 나라 인민들과 영영한 인민군 장병들, 동포형제 여러분, 미국 본토 전역이 우리의 핵 타격 사정권 안에 있으며 핵 단추가 내 사무실 책상 위에 항상 놓여 있다는 것, 이는 결코 위협이 아닌 현실임을 똑바로 알아야 합니다. But Kim did offer one surprise olive branch to America's ally, South Korea, who would be hosting the Winter Olympics that year. Kim sent a 400-strong delegation to the Games. The buses from North Korea rolled across the demilitarized zone on Thursday morning. That This is a really historic moment, an important moment. He even sent his sister, Kim Yo-jung, as his representative. Yoon Gun Young was part of the team welcoming her. In Amman, Sabe, Tian Ming Guru, Chechue, Sarega, Kim Yojong, Il Bujang, Pangan, Yosmida. Tanyoni, Sangde, Dean Junjung, Sangde, Dean Yerago, Sengal Haguyo, Tian Ming Kumin Durun, Kurum Bubun, the Redes, Kipun Insang, Padasmida. Vaishineso do, Kim Jong and Ivanka Darago, Pional Chongdo, Yotabu. Three weeks later, Yun traveled to Pyongyang on the first South Korean delegation to meet Kim Jong Un since he came to power. 문재인 대통령의 평화에 대한 의지, 그리고 한반도 비핵화에 대한 의지를 적극적으로 설명을 했고요. 김정은 위원장은 당신이 가지고 있는 생각들을 저희한테 가감 없이 이야기를 했습니다. 우리 후대들에게 핵무기를 어떻게 넘겨줄 수 있겠느냐? 김정은 위원장의 파격적인 이야기를 들었을 때 놀람 그 자체였습니다. 아울러서 트럼프 대통령을 만날 용의도 있다라는 취지의 발언을 하였습니다. South Korea's national security adviser rushed to the White House. Chung sat next to the president, and we all just took spots around. Chung We Young summarized the, the meeting, and then of course the punchline was and. Uh, Kim Jong-un would, like would like to meet you. The president responded quickly. He said, OK, let's do it. So, <laughs> so we were all, uh, you know, uh, stunned. Most of us thought that the time was not yet right, that more work would need to be done to test North Korea's bottom line uh, before we would put the president in a room. Ambassador Chung just about fell out of his chair because he thought, he thought it was going to be, you know, kind of a hard sell. I felt that it would be better to let 
to, <laughs> to let uh, Pyongyang, Kim Jong-un, feel the pressure a little bit longer. But, of course, the president wouldn't resist, I don't think, the opportunity. And then the president said to Chong wee young hey, and I want you to announce it. I want you to announce it on, on television. Yeah, right. South Korea, correct. South Korea is going to be making a major statement at about 7 o'clock. On what, Mr. What? President? On the big subject. Mr. President, on North, what's going um, to President Trump? 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 On North Korea or on trade? Okay. Yeah. On North Korea or on trade? Did you, you speak today North with the... Mr. President, Prime 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 you will have your Nobel Prize. You will have your Nobel Prize, please. Thank you. You will have your Nobel Prize, Mr. President. Mr. President, what's wrong with you? Uh, good evening. Today, I have the privilege of briefing President Trump on my recent visit to Pyongyang, North Korea. President Trump said he would meet Kim Jong-un to achieve permanent denuclearization. Thank you. The summit that could define Trump's presidency would be held in Singapore. To get there, Kim Jong-un borrowed a plane from China. Kim brought a camera crew along to make a film snappily entitled The Epochal Meeting That Pioneered a New History Between North Korea and the United States. The trip was a rare opportunity for Kim to leave North Korea, and the young dictator made the most of it, hiring the entire top floor of one of Singapore's most exclusive hotels. Though he didn't order any room service for fear of being poisoned. Trump was also reveling in the moment. He made sure the cameras were perfectly positioned to capture a meeting that he wanted to go down in history. The leader of the free world, President Trump, meeting face to face with one of the world's most brutal dictators. President Trump was very gracious. He wanted to draw out Kim uh, to get a, a measure of him and, and a feel for his personality. Trump said, you know, I, I can always tell with someone uh, uh, whether we're going to have a good relationship. I can tell it in an instant. Trump obviously thought he had a new best friend in Kim Jong-un. Knowing Kim was a Hollywood movie buff, Trump tried to win round his new friend with a specially commissioned film. It was an icebreaker to put an iPad in his hand, hit play, and to have this sort of, uh, uh, you know, movie preview uh, trailer style uh, uh, video of, of what's possible. A new world can begin today. One of friendship, respect, and goodwill. Where the doors of opportunity are ready to be open. Investment from around the world. The future remains to be written. But the North Korean leader wasted little time before raising the controversial subject of US troops stationed in South Korea. Kim Jong-un, as he had many times in the past, complained about the big joint exercises between South Korean and American forces, which have been going on uh, on the Korean Peninsula for about 60 years plus. Trump, out of nowhere, said, I'm going to cancel the war games, as he called them. There's no need for them. They're very expensive, and it'll make you happy. But I couldn't believe it. The president's calculation was, was a small give to see what what Kim was willing to put on the table. Colleagues at the Pentagon view, <laughs> viewed it very diff differently um, because their job is to man, train, and equip and, and plan and prepare for war. I'm getting a text in, in real time from my colleague Matt Pottinger, and he said that the president just uh, canceled our exercises with the South Koreans. This had not been uh, previously planned. We hadn't informed the South Koreans, hadn't informed the Japanese. Pompeo Kelly and I were sitting there in the room with Trump, and we weren't consulted. 
It came simply from Trump's own mind. It was an unforced error. It was a concession for which we got nothing in return. As the US military scrambled to inform allies in the region, Trump and Kim put pen to paper on an agreement. It promised further talks on nuclear disarmament, but it was light on detail. Trump thought that US-North Korean relations were great because he and Kim were buddies. Uh, and it's a, it's a very dangerous perception. It's, it's not to understate the importance of personal relations in foreign policy, but the relationship between two leaders is not the same as the relationship between the two countries. Trump returned to Washington triumphant, claiming he'd averted nuclear war. He was now ready to show what else his unique brand of diplomacy could deliver. Now that Donald Trump saw that he could get a meeting with Kim Jong-un on his own without the help of the Chinese, that kind of left his hand free to turn to this other issue that was lurking in the background all this time, this major issue on trade. President of China. Mm -hmm. Great guy. I want him to treat us better on trade. That's my only problem. Last year, we lost $500 billion with China. We can't do that anymore. Trump's China hawks had been urging the president to deliver on his promise to get tough on Beijing. This was their moment. Their system was one that was designed to build up China, all of which is fine, uh, except the United States was paying the ticket for it. I remember in one of those meetings, Ambassador Lighthizer pulling out a chart and pointing to this, this chart that looked like a steep staircase. And it was a timeline. And the, the timeline was, well, here, here's the, 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 the Clinton administration's uh, dialogue that they did for years with China. And here's the Bush administration's strategic and economic dialogue. And here's President Obama's dialogue. And the backdrop to it was, our trade deficit skyrocketing. And Lighthizer saying, how many more dialogues are we gonna do before we actually take matters into our own hands? Lighthizer wanted to impose sweeping new tariffs on China. But some of Trump's team had long feared that picking a fight with America's great rival would provoke a trade war with damaging consequences for the US. Gary Cohn was chief among them. There was an agreement that China was a bad actor when it came to trade. The question then became, how do you deal with that? Gary said, let's go after China, but let's develop a clear strategy. If the US takes this step and put tariffs in place, what's going to happen? You know, what are they going to retaliate on? How is that going to impact the market? People thought that the stock market would crash and the economy would go into recession. To me, tariffs aren't either good nor bad, right? Tariffs are just a tool. The problem is the only thing the tariff was doing was acting as a consumption tax to the US consumer that bought that good from China. What it comes down to is if it's an important problem, and if you have to act, you use the only thing you have, which is access to your market. President Trump turning tough trade talk into action. Tariffs on $34 billion worth of Chinese goods. President Trump's trade war with China just escalated in a big way. Tariffs on $200 billion worth of goods made in China. China is now punching back the biggest trade battle the U.S. has been in since the Great Depression. By the end of the year, the tariffs had started to bite for both American and Chinese exporters. Trump and Xi met for dinner on the sidelines of the G20 summit. The dinner began with a long portion of it taken up by flattery uh, of Trump by Xi Jinping. And uh, one of the points he made was, you know, you have too many elections in America. It'd be, it'd be much better if, uh, if you could stay longer. And Trump said, well, you know, I hear people saying that maybe I should get a third term. Now, the, the only people in America saying he should get a third term were himself and Jared Kushner. This, this is the affinity that Trump has with authoritarian leaders. Xi Jinping doesn't have term limits, and I think Trump envied that. The Chinese president suggested a way out of the trade war. 
In return for the US lifting the tariffs, China would buy more American agricultural products, like corn and soybeans. This would put money back in the pockets of the farmers whose votes would be crucial for Trump's re-election. Xi Jinping said in front of his other advisors that he was serious about wanting a deal with the United States and he was serious about dealing with some of the core issues that we were raising on forced technology transfer and on intellectual property. He also talked about wanting to help U.S. farmers. And, and, and that signaled to the Chinese side that it was time to stop messing around and actually engage and try to get to yes. If you view the trade dispute from a dignity perspective, when they slam your, your face, you should slam back. Um, but if you view that from a strategic long-term perspective, China needs a stable bilateral relations with the U.S. So President Xi made that decision that we need to uh, sit down and uh, scale down the problem with the United States, uh, try to cool the heat. A temporary truce was agreed. Trump promised not to impose any further tariffs on China for now. While his officials got to work on a trade deal, Trump traveled to Vietnam for his make or break second date with Kim Jong-un. In the year since their last summit, the negotiating teams had made little progress. As we drove over to the venue from what the Secret Service calls the Beast, the president's limousine, Trump was ruminating back and forth, would it be better if I walked out or better if I agreed to a smaller deal? I felt uh, it was important for Trump to understand that uh, he, he didn't have to come away with the deal. If we didn't get the deal that we wanted, which was a commitment to complete denuclearization along the lines we wanted, that he had to walk away from it. North Korea hadn't tested any more nuclear weapons, but nor had they made any concrete offer to get rid of their program. We stress that this is a historic opportunity that won't come again, that uh, our president is willing to do different things, bold things, and that he was 100% completely serious when he talked about transforming the US DPRK relationship, that he could see a brighter economic future for North Korea, that uh, even you know, from his background as a real estate developer, he could see where those hotels were gonna go on the North Korean beaches, and he was dead serious about it. But if the North Koreans missed this opportunity, it wouldn't come around again. Kim's pitch focused on what he claimed was his country's most important nuclear site. What Kim was saying was, we will give up the Yangbyon complex, although he didn't really define that very carefully. And in exchange, you will lift the economic sanctions that the UN Security Council had imposed on uh, North Korea. It was utterly the opposite of the real commitment to total denuclearization. Give us Yangbyon means what? Give, uh, give us uh, the two reactors and destroy them? Does it mean destroy all the various uh, buildings and facilities on the site, which are over a couple of hundred, what do you mean give us Yangbyon? And they were never ever really able to define that. In the course of the back and forth, as uh, Trump was looking for something better than the offer that uh, the North Koreans kept insisting, he said uh, may maybe a lesser reduction in the sanctions. Uh, can, can you do that? And uh, I, I thought that was the most dangerous moment uh, of the whole meeting because if Kim had said, yes, I'll take a 50% reduction, Trump would have thumped the table and said, deal, and, and it would have been a disaster. The offer didn't come. The Secret Service swept in and said, uh, we're pulling out early, we're leaving. I think our relationship is very strong, but at this time, we had some options, and at this time, we decided not to do any of the options. Sometimes you have to walk. Trump was so intent on making a deal but he understood that politically it would be very negative for him if he accepted what Kim held out there. It's the potential political blowback in the United States that he cares about. And he finally said, uh, I, I just can't do this. But it was, in my view, very, very close. The deal was dead. 
but the bromance lived on. President Trump offered Kim a lift home on Air Force One. It was a gracious gesture. The president it knew that Kim had arrived on a multi-day train ride uh, uh, through China uh, into uh, Hanoi. And uh, uh, the president said, I can get you home in two hours uh, if, if you want. Uh, Kim declined. The collapse of the talks with Kim was the last thing Trump needed with the election clock ticking. The pressure was now on to deliver a historic trade deal with China that he could sell on the campaign trail. In April, after months of negotiations, Robert Lighthizer arrived in Beijing expecting to finalize an agreement. When Lighthizer went to Beijing, he asked Liu He, um, you know, you said you could accept a bunch of this text, and Liu He said, I can't do it anymore. Some of the more hardline advisors in China uh, thought that it would look like China was giving away too much um, and not getting enough in return from, from the United States. You know, China has suffered uh, in the Western powers in the 18th century, 19th century, and there are many uh, equal treaties was, was signed in the past. So China doesn't want to repeat that. The biggest sticking point was the US demand that China change its laws on how the two countries did business before the tariffs could be lifted. To put all those items in the laws is not uh, something we cannot accept, but it needs time. Can the US assure us that they can pass a law in six months or three months? I think they cannot. When they sat back and they looked and they said, holy cow, this is like a real agreement, like, in, you know, you know, like lawyers would write an agreement and we're taking on obligations and it's enforceable. My guess is there was some digestion. We had a deal that was very close and then they broke it. They really did. I mean, more than just, more than renegotiate, they really broke it. So we can't have that happen. Our people, if they want, they could buy from someplace else other than China or they can really, the ideal is make their product in the USA, that's what I really want. Yeah, we're winning it. You know what? You want to know something? Do you want to know something? We always win. We always win. The gloves were off. Trump announced another huge increase in tariffs on $200 billion of Chinese goods and up the ante by sanctioning some of China's most important companies, including technology giant Huawei. The expansion of the trade war to Huawei and other high-tech Chinese company, for us, are the vivid examples uh, showing that the, the US does not want China to, uh, to develop, to surpass the US. The US does not want China to dominate in uh, advanced, important, uh, industries like 5G's. Huawei and other Chinese telecoms companies are not commercial entities. They are arms of the Chinese state. This was the tip of a spear. It was about getting your equipment into the most sensitive parts of a, a nation's it, critical infrastructure. It would basically give China the, the keys to the kingdom. The US always say it's not safe. Your security will be breached your privacy will be breached. But have we seen any smoking gun here? No, no smoking gun. Meanwhile, tensions had been escalating in the South China Sea, a vital international shipping lane. U.S. military aircraft, Papa 8 Alpha. This is the Chinese Yonsu Reef. China had 70 of the National Islands leave immediately and keep far off so as to avoid any misunderstanding. The bilateral relations uh, was marching towards a, a deterioration that we have never imagined before. So some people call it new, the new Cold War. That summer, pro-democracy protests broke out in Hong Kong. world leaders would line up to condemn the Chinese government's clampdown. 
But with the US elections just over a year away, and with nothing to show for his negotiations so far, Trump saw an opportunity for some peacemaking. The president said to Xi Jinping, look, this is your decision about Hong Kong, after Xi himself had raised it. So it was giving Xi Jinping a green light uh, in Hong Kong that I thought was very uh, poorly advised. When the two men met at the G20 in Osaka, Trump again stunned his team. This time, over human rights abuses against Uyghur Muslims in northwest China. Xi had discussed the situation in Xinjiang, and Trump said he approved of what the, the Chinese policy was, which was effectively to build uh, concentration camps. Trump simply didn't see this as indicative of Chinese attitudes and behavior that would affect us internationally. Trump seemed ready to go to remarkable lengths to get what he wanted. The meeting really centered around the continuing effort to see if we could get the big trade deal, what Trump insisted on calling the deal of the century. In the course of uh, the conversation, Trump implied that the constraints on Huawei and some of the other sanctions that had been imposed on Chinese companies might be bargainable in the trade talks. Uh, now, uh, it's true they involve trade issues, but it was a very dangerous precedent to say that the American law enforcement system was on the bargaining table. As election year began, Trump finally got an agreement with the Chinese. But it was far from the deal of the century he'd promised. The US would ease tariffs, and China would buy an extra $200 billion of US products over the next two years. But it wouldn't commit to some of the most important reforms the US had been pushing for. We got used to the tactic that uh, President Trump used. You can say brinkmanship, all the maximum pressure. He used that to make you believe that uh, some serious conflict will happen if you don't change your, your position. But you understand that this is only a tactic. And uh, he, he still wants uh, a deal. This is an unbelievable deal for the United States, keeping these two giant and powerful nations together in harmony is so important for the world. It's a very uh, beautiful mosaic. Within weeks, the deal would be eclipsed. The day the deal was signed came just one day after the National Security Council staff had convened our first uh, interagency meeting uh, about this mysterious virus that had appeared in Wuhan. When I got home, I started to dig through old files to find phone numbers for uh, Chinese physicians uh, that, that I knew 17 years earlier when I had been a, a journalist covering the SARS epidemic. And uh, what they told me um, uh, uh, scared me. The president was given an emergency briefing. The doctors said, we believe that it's deadlier than the flu and it's just more contagious. And I remember the president taking a pause and taking that in. And I remember him actually saying, huh, so this is bad. Matt Pottinger was saying, oh, I don't believe uh, what the Chinese are saying. I think this is worse. We should be preparing for it to come here. And the president says, I don't want to go after the president of China. We need to be doing our best to support these people. Soon, the president would be forced to act. One morning, one of my contacts in China was on the line with me as I was driving into work. And I said, so is this going to be as bad as SARS 2003? And the doctor said, don't think SARS 2003. This is 1918. Think 1918. And uh, when I got to the White House, uh, I reported this up to the National Security Advisor, Robert O'Brien. He said, come with me. And he pulled me in to the president's intel briefing. 
and I joined a conversation there where we related to the president um, what we knew. The president said, um, "Would do you think we should cut off travel?" Um, uh, Robert O'Brien and I said that we we thought that was the right thing to do. The president realizes if he doesn't want this crisis to become even graver, then this is the first step that needs to happen. Four nationals who are deemed a risk barred from entering the country. Major U.S. airlines suspending all flights to China as fears rise of a global pandemic. Any goodwill Trump had been building with President Xi was fast evaporating. Uh, the ink wasn't dry on a great trade deal, and all of a sudden, the plague comes in from China. We're not happy about it. In the months that followed, Trump's handling of the pandemic would help seal the fate of his presidency. But you notice the fake news now, right? All they talk about is COVID, 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 COVID. Joe Biden has been declared the next president of the United States. A rare defeat of a sitting commander in chief. As Trump's presidency came to an end, the problems of North Korea and China loomed as large as ever. A week before Trump left the White House, North Korea unveiled a new phase in its nuclear program with America in its sights. And China declared that it was the only major country in the world whose economy had grown in the last year. The rivalry that Trump had stoked was now closer to igniting. He did something no president had ever done before. None of them had ever really stood up to China and said, this is not going to go on anymore. And I want the, the United States to, to, to be number one in the world. It is now, and I want to say that way. The view in China is the Trump administration will not allow China to surpass the US. The US can never be number two, and China can never be number one. We Chinese, of course, believe we have that right. And if the US, if the American believe we don't have that right, we will definitely have conflicts and clashes. We have the greatest country in the world. We have the greatest economy in the world. The future of this country has never been better. So just a goodbye. We love you. We will be back in some form. President Trump was an unorthodox president, an unorthodox style, unorthodox in substance. And it took this disruption, this disruptor, to lay plain many of the assumptions which had grown threadbare uh, and which, which needed to be refreshed and renewed, particularly on the subject of China. Trump leaves behind the controversial legacy of America first. President Biden has promised to reverse much of his foreign policy, but on China, he said that he will continue to take a tough line. What influence did Trump's extensive use of social media have on global affairs? Discover the impact of Trump's tweets at bbc.co.uk slash Trump